The Malkador Battle Tank Story continued From Tankers V's Tau Story So Far Piter, the Gevasa officer, stood dramatically, deeply breathing in the air. He expelled slowly, savoring the moment. A human, but attired in the colors and cloth of the Tau Empire. With a self-assured smile and a look of determination in his eye, he turned to the four tank crew that had sat in this holding camp for the last eight months. They were not enjoying the sun. They were not inhaling the fresh, clean skies. They did as they always did when he met them. They glared at him. So, to what do we owe the honour of your presence, Piter? Snapped the leader. I just thought I'd pop down to see how you're all getting on. Good food, real food. Clean, fresh water, walks, placidity. Surely this is better. Surely you can see the greater good in action. And at that, all four spat on the ground in unison. <laughs> it was not rehearsed. It was an automatic reaction at this point. Ritualized, almost. They had been together here, separated from the rest of the camp, and Piter was always bemused by them. Always. They had so much space here, so much breathing room. Yet every time he saw them, none was more than five foot from another. It was almost like their shared bond kept tugging them closer as they experienced more pressure. They were not inside a tank any longer. Yet could they ever be said to truly have escaped it? Piter sighed and shook his head. At least he still had one. They had almost put pay to that. That disgusting tool covered in mud. It was going to take his head off. But then, he had seen its wielder explode in a crossfire, dissecting disco of lights, as his own squad had taken the assailant to pieces. His body had juddered as he was struck. A terrible reek joined the stench from the battlefield burnt meat. Pite had gotten to his feet in time to pull his squad off them. The tank crew were not going anywhere. They were unconscious, but even so, when he saw them next, they were more dejected than he had ever seen a human in all his life. All because their glorious army of butchers had been defeated. They had been defeated. Their emperor had been defeated. Yet Piter, at this moment, discerned a wry smile coming from their officer. Skipper, as they had called him. He was going to be trouble. He was always trouble. And that he most certainly proved to be. They had taken a relatively small amount of captives. A mere thousand. Give or take a score or two. The maniacs of the Imperium had mostly fought to the last. Utter insanity. Many escaped. Too many to be comfortable. And these had caused endless troubles of their own. But Piter could not understand his charges. For the Ethereal, he had tasked him with a great duty, a great burden. He was to show his fellow humans the light. He, Piter was to bring them into the greater good. A job he initially leapt at, thinking it would be easy. How could it not be? For his world was lush and green, beautiful and bountiful. Now, because of the Tau Empire, and it was impossible to refute the benefits that had been brought, impossible to deny the good that had been done, all part of the greater good. Yet, he was bemused at it all from day one. But the first weeks were a picnic compared to every day since. Most of the support staff had surrendered. Some soldiery were taken as they were injured. 
When these were healed and returned to the pens, the soldiers, all hell broke loose. That night, there was shouting and alarm. When fire warriors were sent in to investigate, they were jumped by elements in the rabble and pulled apart. The armed prisoners then headed straight for the gate, and it took five hours and a score of drones to bring things back under control. We put them all on lockdown, and when we cleared up, we found a dozen men hung in the dorms. Investigation led to a simple conclusion. The returning soldiery had executed the highest-ranked traitors as they could. Only one survived this purge, the tank commander, the one they called Skipper. But nobody would say why. And from that night onwards, they never let up. We separated the soldiery, but still, little changed. We found out eventually that it was this Skipper who was behind most of it. He was a motive force in every attempted break, every tunnel, every concerted push to the gates when our guard was down, or any rush on separated guards. We had to change from fire warriors to Givasa guards. The fire warriors were getting trigger happy, and despite being armed, we humans are bigger. It made the prisoners emboldened seeing them so small, and whenever one of them or a group were killed, it was like blood in the water. So we switched guards. At first, this caused even more issues. The horrific things the soldiery in particular would do to any that they could separate and attack. It was so much worse than the Tau. I could not fathom how or why, but we enraged them even more than their alien slurs. I had no choice but to separate them even further. One camp became four. One for the genuine soldiery. One for the support staff that were placid, well, generally. One for those who were still more scared of their own, the retribution they thought they would receive if their Imperium returned in numbers. They were still truculent at points. And this skipper and his tank crew, and the annoying little ones, the tiny horrors. They had to be put in a camp just for the four of them, and the unspeakable rattlings. They could not be trusted. The rattlings were a plague. Some days they could not be found at all, only to appear the next night, full to the brim and belching in ecstasy, mimicking having been out of the camp. But of course, there could be no way for them to actually escape. Nor would they have returned to the pens if they had done so. And yet, so many provisions went missing. So many meals had spoiled, and we guards were subjected to the rear-end growls. Belts were always slack those days. Pathways to the latrines kept wide open. But how could they escape? Why would they return? It was baffling. And again, I suspected a secret mind scientist amongst their number. For indeed, they were driving me slowly but steadily mad. Thankfully, the only Ogryn were few. They died in the first nights when the actual soldiery returned to the pens, but two were left. As they joined them in the uprisings, and they did not duck. They did not dodge our fire. We blew them to pieces. But two were left, Grog and Brog, both used to spend most of their time with this skipper. He seemed to be keeping them in line with his crew. But I could tell. He was simply saving them to be unleashed at the worst possible moment. So, of course, I had them moved to the more servile pen, and they were astonishingly quiet the entire time, during the day. But at night, they could have bad dreams, and then rampage. The casualties could be harsh on the prisoners. I did not order them to be executed. I could not do that. It was so simple, childlike. But I did have them sedated. And within a few days, 
We had them painting the entire pen structure. Nobody quite knew why there were so many flowers in the walls, but none bothered to really pursue the situation. It was simply not worth angering the two of them. The night terrors left them, and all was well in the one pen at the least. But not even Grog or Brog were able to accept anything but their emperor into their hearts. The soldiery, I understood. The tank crew, I knew better. I was aware how much this would be a wasted effort. The rattlings. The rattlings. Just annoyed anyone who tried it on with them. I remember them playing along for two whole weeks. I was about to consider moving them out of the pens. Things had gone so well in my estimation. But at the last, they used the new clothes that I gave them to create hammocks. They then laughed at me and wandered off. Little bust. I have spent too much time around Skipper and his crew. This is not right. My time was running out. I was not managing it. Their ears were closed to aught I said, but most especially to the greater good. And so, my remit had altered. I seemed to have lost the faith of the ethereals. Of this I had no doubt. But they made me feel useful. <laughs> Probably out of pity. And I was tasked to gain intel instead. Not easy. Because humans in the Imperium are lied to so often, they are quicker witted than our own of this planet. Their mistrust so ingrained, I did not do well at this either. Not really. I continued my attempt to probe the tank crew. So, Skipper, I've finally been told you led the retreat. You must be proud. I am. More than a few of our boys got out. Yes, they did. But we have them now. All of them. I play to their ego. They fought hard, of course. Ha! Okay. Well done. Especially that large tank. We captured it. What? Not Bill? Blurts out the one called Gobby. We cornered it. They had no choice. They surrendered. The officer flares at this, then his expression changes, and he begins to jeer at me, and the rest join in. Of course they do. <laughs> I look dumbfounded at them, then my jaw drops as the skipper starts to talk. Oh, did they now? What, Captain Arbus, surrender? What a joke. Don't tell me, your next questions will be, oh so pretty, eh? How fast do you think it went? Pity it ran out of ammo. It seemed slow. How much can it carry? Guess where we found it. You're here to find out about Bill, aren't you? Because, my lads, he says to his crew, they ain't got him yet. Triumphantly, he leers at me as he says, Bill is still out there, ain't he? Then the howling and baying at me leapt up in volume. <laughs> I snapped my jaw closed, but it's too late. How? Is a skipper a mind scientist? How did he know? He leans back and waves me away. The others take up the motion. I retreat. They've done it again. How I hate these barbarians now. These simple-minded fanatics. We look the same, but that, I assure you, is as far as the connection goes. They know this war cannot end until these scum give up, and they protect the war despite having zero chance of victory. In spite of it all, they are horrors. Night fell and I tried to sleep, the memories of the battle wafting back into my brain. The smells, the first thing to hit me, as I knew instantly that I was indeed in a dream. 
Yet, the knowing did not make me proof from its power. I swept into that burning day again of hate and war. The day we toppled the mighty armies of the Imperium. The horrors. The scene had been set. The Mont Car, the killing stroke, was ready. And the Imperium had fallen for the bait. Our Tau lines held firm at the rear of a long valley. The perfect place for a hard point. The perfect place for an ambush. But the force and fury of the human attackers was unlike anything we had seen before. They were suicidal in their rush to get at the Tau facility. And each time we Tau had sought them beaten, that is when they would come on with twice the furore. The tanks had been smashed by our large battle suits, causing a veritable garden of smoking hulls with their crews spayed out in a hole in the rear of any tank hit. Rail guns. Unpleasant, but necessary. Yet, they had brought up a huge tank, a super heavy of such rarity that none had seen its like before, and it blew the lines of battle suits to scrap and continued towards the generators. It brought down shields whenever it fired, released deluges of fire into our tower lines behind. Theirs were taken by we towered first, but then the Imperial Navy set its transports and they took back control. Onwards they rushed, bringing up Ogryn to cover their flanks, Vostrian first-born elite troops in the middle, rattling snipers, taking our Pathfinder's heads off. I hate them so much. I shouldn't. But I do. We had them in the center of the valley. Even their air power was now diminishing. Their cavalry, hideous beasts of burden ridden into battle, Ugh. barreled into our own encircling forces. It was looking bad as it was meant to do. Despite the horse troops being a surprise, we had them. Stealth suits penetrated their rear bases and cut the head from the snake. Crisis suits then came in and took out their airfields and many of the artillery support. Not all, but a fair amount. But the zealots did not break. We had removed all support, trapped them, confused them, were slaughtering them. But they would not break. Our hammerheads came over the top of the valley and fired down. They exterminated most of the remaining tanks, hammered into the lines of Ogryn and elite guardsmen with their strange hats. Yet they could not strike directly at the Super Heavy. It seemed to radically change course out of nowhere and hug the walls of the valley out of sight of our hammerheads. And that dratted small tank at the front caused so much pain, and panic and confusion. The smaller tank drew so much fire that the blasted Super Heavy got away in the most bloody of possible routes. It veered and took one of the alleys that we thought it would not be able to fit down. It was tight indeed. I saw the branching exit from the valley later. I wish I had not. For multiple of our firecast cadres had been stationed there in ambush. The tank was so wide, they thought so unexpected, and it rolled over everyone it did not shoot to pieces first. Many Tau warriors died under its treads. Too many. While that happened, the giants, these Ogryn, they bellowed and charged. They had repulsed an assault by our gallant Kut allies, but now they seemed to just go berserk. Before we could see that it was planned, it was over. Because someone, despite having executed their entire command staff, destroyed most of their ranking tanks, someone had seen what we were trying. Now I know it to be Skipper in my custody. He somehow got them together. While drawing fire from the entire facility and ridges, he got the infantry to fight their way out of our encirclement. On the left flank, this did not happen. Our pathfinders were too accurate, the crew too dogmatic to allow them through, but near half of the remaining force pushed through on the right flank. The Ogrim barreled on, followed by the Vostroyans and many of the Rattlings, but not 
war. After their escape, for the next week, it was never-ending sorrow. For the rattlings were still in the valley, in small units individually, hidden deep in the undergrowth. The miserable wretches sniped out our people as they went to clear the field. Even when carrying away the fallen, the dead, the little runts took one head off, then moved, or went silent and did not fire again, but it was happening all over the valley. We ended up having to release a hundred drones to burn every inch to the ground. A vast waste of resources. A burnt scar on the landscape of my world. We searched later, of course. And it was revealed. It was only eleven of them. They had delayed and slain us so much. If they had been captured, they would not have seen out the night. Better they burned and ended quickly. To think that something so small could do so much damage for it so much pain. But in the last they were stopped. All of this was distant to me. I was on the central courtyard when they came in. A small tank that seemed to be driven by a crew of madmen, utterly unpredictable, throwing off our scopes. They burned and barreled through anything they could. But in the last, they were stopped. A hit from one of our plasma rifles took out their tracks. And as we advanced on the damn thing, the last infantry supporting the rear guard action, which seemed to be made up almost exclusively by said tank and crew, ran up to support them. But our orderly fire lines tore into the said infantry. Red coats and black hats were bursting into flame and being parched as they were hit by our firepower. The tank crew disembarked as our hammerheads came over the ridge even further. And that is when I struck. I charged them. I wanted to stop them. I wanted to make them pay. I wanted to kill this tank crew. Hand-to-hand -hand combat began with me at the front. I did not see what exactly had happened with the crew, but one of them came at me. He was armed with a flat metal heart on a stick. He swung at me, and as I ducked under the assault, I was not fast enough. He kept going round in a circle and brought the metal flat up under my chin. I launched backwards. My head hit the ground first, dazing me with lights and pain. The rest of me followed, of course. But the head was so agonizing. I could do nothing but hold it with both my hands. I thought it would explode. The pain in my broken jaw, the concussion at minimum I would have from the strike on my landing. And when I opened my eyes, my mind cleared. He was standing over me. He aimed the heart shape at my neck. He was going to cut my head off. But lights flashed and he was hurled backwards as plasma charges smashed him off his feet. He was dead long before he could hit the ground. The others, they had been beaten down, were still receiving brutal kickings from my colleagues. I did not want to move. I wanted to lay there and pass out. But as a ranking officer, I got to my feet. The world swam, my stomach churned. The thought of opening my broken mouth wide was the only thing stopping me from hurling up. But I staggered to one group, and I pulled them off the crewman he was kicking. It spread. We had them. They were going nowhere for quite some time. Four out of five of them was not bad, I thought. We could try them and I could then legally execute them, if the ethereal would permit it. But of course, he did not. And my dream ends with the ethereal smiling as he orders me to attempt the impossible, to turn these mindless barbarians to the path of righteousness, to bring them into the greater good. I wake, sweat pooled beneath me on my pillow, everywhere. 
I do not need to see the chronometer to know it is not even close to dawn. I turn the sheets over, trying to gain some dry cover, and I lean back. But something is not right. It is then that I am aware of what I hear, low and distant at first, then louder as it gets closer, and, by all that is good and pure, I feel my gut wrench, my stomach clench, my arms spasm. I sit bolt upright and check. There is no mistaking this. Through the window I can see a watchtower explode into broken kindling. Suddenly ashen-faced, I know what it is. It is the sound of that one terror from my nightmares. It is here. Ethereal's guide and protect us. It is bonus Bill. The Bane Blade. Story continued after the law. Welcome, gentle listener, I am Baltimore, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, faces, and units of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And just to note, we also have channels for mythology and natural history, links in the description. We now have super thanks, so like, subscribe, and throw me a coin if you enjoyed the video more than usual, or patron, of course. Now, let us proceed. For today, we are to discuss one of the older versions of Heavy Tank employed by the Imperium. Now, in most cases in the Warhammer universe, for the Imperium and humanity at the least, older means better, usually, because technological regression had been one of the defining traits of the setting, of course until the coming of Belisarius' call and the return of the Primarch, Rebute Gilliman. Something I obviously consider a fundamental writing flaw, which will not truly be realized for another decade. For some core traits of a setting are what make it popular. They are in its DNA. And this can only be altered if one understands the overall whole. Alas... I do not think the tinkering that they have done will bring them a better setting, but as stated, it will take some time for this nudging of the law to truly take effect. I shudder to think that, with all the best intentions in the world, the inexperienced or arrogant chefs now in the kitchen might have ruined their meal with over-seasoning. But truthfully, what older chap does not bemoan the frantic actions of their chronological juniors, eh? Tale as old as time. So let us move on. Even so, the Malkador battle tank is an anomaly in this general rule, as it was replaced very swiftly when patterns of SDC were found with the far more potent Lehman Russ and Land Raider chassis. Hence, and because of my extensive tale this week, I have not rewritten the core text, as some so gallantly slapped themselves on the back for doing, and I will dish it up straight. And so, as usual... For the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, The Malkador Assault Tank The Malkador Assault Tank, also known as the Malkador Heavy Tank, is a venerable pattern of armoured vehicle that predates the Lehman Rust Tank in the Imperium of Mankind's service. It is not widely used by Imperial Armed Forces at the present time, and is, in fact, little known even within the Imperial military. In many regions of the Imperium, the Malkador passed out of common service many millennia ago. The few Malkadors that remain have been relegated to the Departmento Munitorum's strategic reserve, to the arsenals of second-line planetary defense forces, or are maintained in active service only by a few units of the Imperial Guard due to ancient tradition history. The Malkador Assault Tank is a truly ancient design dating back to the wars that consumed terror during the Age of Strife. The imperial production model of this heavy tank was named after Malkador the Sigilite, 
the regent of Terra and right hand of the Emperor of Mankind during the Unification Wars, the Great Crusade, and the Horus Heresy of the late 30th and early 31st millennium. The Imperial Malkador tank was produced by the thousands, by the Forge Worlds of Mars and Voss during the beginning of the Great Crusade, where it was one of the primary battle tanks of both the Imperial Army and the Legiones Astartes, the Space Marines. Although the Malkador was not as heavily armed as Goliath such as the Baneblade or the Stormhammer, or as heavily armoured as the Land Raider, it possessed a number of advantages to its design, the principle of which was its battle speed, which was formidable for a tank of its size thanks to its highly sophisticated, if temperamental, drive system. The Malkador's design also allowed it to fight in the harsh conditions of the Void, which was why it was most commonly associated with the elite Solar Auxilia cohorts of the Imperial Army during the time of the Great Crusade. The Malkador's design, however, does suffer from flaws. Most telling is the relative vulnerability of its propulsion systems and the limited traverse of its main battle turret. The Malkador was eventually replaced in Legion service by the land raider Proteus, and by the time of the Horus Heresy, many Malkador tanks had been relegated to the Legion's strategic reserves and second-line Imperial Army units, only to be replaced by larger numbers of smaller, more tactically flexible tanks, such as the Lehman Russ and its many variants. The demands of the galaxy-wide civil war, the Horus Heresy, soon brought them back into the fray, and their ubiquitousness in the Imperial Reserves saw them used as test beds for a variety of new variants intended to replace losses and fill gaps in supply and resource. By the time of the late 41st millennium, the Malkador Heavy Tank and its various replacement parts are now only produced by a very few of the Adeptus Mechanicus Forge Worlds, Though the plant of Macan Secundus in the Segmentum Pacificus is one rare exception where the Malkador is produced in relatively large numbers. The Malkador was designed to fill the role of a main battle tank for the Imperial Guard. Though the Malkador pattern is somewhat larger and heavier than the Lehman Russ pattern, they replaced it as a standard tank of the Guard. The Malkador has considerable durability as a result of its sheer bulk and the heavy layers of armoured plating that it is wrapped in. It is well armed for its size, with a battle cannon mounted in a limited traverse turret embrasure. This main weapon is supplemented by a hull and two additional Sponson heavy weapon mounts, and a hull mount that can carry attached heavy stubbers, heavy bolters, las cannons, or even auto cannons. The Malkador does possess such limitations, however, especially when compared to the lighter but more versatile Lehman Russ. The overall shape of the tank reduces the traverse range of its sponson and hull weapons, producing a limited arc of fire due to its heavy armor plating and reinforced weapons mounts. Its immobile main turret can also prove to be a problem in chaotic engagement, where the lines of battle interpenetrate and the foe's infantry or armor units can take advantage of the Malkador's limited firing arcs. Experienced commanders minimize these problems by combining other armored variants and infantry support with their squadrons of Malkadors. The Malkador tank could be outfitted with a variety of upgrades and attachments, such as camouflage netting, extra armored plating, an improved communication system, a hunter-killer missile launcher, a minesweeper, a pintle-mounted heavy stubber, rough terrain modifications, track guards, a searchlight, and of course, smoke launchers. However, the tank has another major problem, the vulnerability of its engine. The Malkador's main engine plant, a thermic combustor design that is a variant for military use of a common pattern used in industrial and agricultural machinery across the human settled galaxy, is underpowered in relation to the Malkador's sheer size. This reduces its performance and provides very poor fuel efficiency. This problem has often plagued the Malkador and its variants, and has been the primary reason why this pattern of heavy tank has been relegated to second-line status amongst the Imperial military forces. During the Great Crusade and the Heresy, the Malkador was used by most forces as a main battle tank, 
until it was replaced in service by more powerful vehicles such as the Land Raider Proteus, as we know. The Malkadors of this era featured many variants that had been lost to the Imperium over the subsequent millennia, the most notable being the full understanding of the vehicle's engine and drive system. For during the earliest eras of Imperial history, the Malkador was lauded for its formidable battle speed, a feature that has now been lost, for many Imperial commanders now see the Malkador as unreliable at best. The Malkador was also once capable of being outfitted with flare shield technology, which is now lost or forgotten by the Imperium. Flare shields were similar to present-day Imperial Void Shield technology, but were effective on a smaller scale. It is unknown if this technology is still in use in parts of the Imperium in the late 41st millennium, or if this has been lost over the millennia like so much else from that era. During these ancient times, it was also common practice to equip Malkadors with an additional layer of ceramic plating for added protection against enemy fire. Some of the known variants of the battle tank are the Squadron Command Tank. Another was the Malkador Annihilator, which replaced the standard variant's limited traverse battle cannon with a twin-linked LAS cannon. The Malkador Defender is arguably the most effective of the Malkador tank variants. It is more common in many Imperial armories than the standard heavy tank upon which it is based. Like the Malkador Annihilator, the heavy weapon mount is replaced by a demolisher cannon. The Malkador Infernus The Malkador Infernus has been mostly replaced by the faster and more reliable Hellhound in frontline Imperial Guard regiments. The Infernus is armed with a massive flamer known as an Inferno Gun. The Valdor Tank Hunter the Valdor Tank Hunter is named after another of the Imperium's ancient heroes from the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy era, Captain General Constantine Valdor of the Legio Custodes, and it was developed near the end of the Great Crusade by the Mechanicum using retro-engineered Archaeotech recovered by Mechanicum Explorators out of the forge word of Galatea that was known as a Neutron Laser Projector. The Minotaur Heavy Artillery Tank The Minotaur is a self-propelled artillery tank that uses the Malkador's basic chassis and advanced engine drive system. The tank is armed with two rear-facing twin-linked Earthshaker cannons mounted on a central axis point with a complex stabilizer system. This weapon's location allows ample room for the storage of a large number of shells which are kept to the sides of the cannon in armored storage lockers to protect them from enemy fire. The Earthshaker cannon is capable of laying down heavy barrages and accurate though indirect fire even when under heavy enemy assault. End quote. And so we can see the import and history of these venerable battle tanks. A brief glimpse into the distant past, yes, but also still relevant today as there are some smaller forge worlds who still pump out these war horses. And you know what? I might just acquire one myself. They look so chunky. For they may not be the biggest or the best, but they are still rugged, effective and resilient. A testament to the ingenuity of the human race. And for that, if that alone, I adore them. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. Now subscribe and like and all that stuff if you enjoyed the video. And join me every Friday as I take deep dives into the Warhammer universe. Or check out our other channels on natural history and mythology. Links in the description. Patron merch, notification button, you know the boogaloo. Until then, thank you for your precious time. And now, back to the story. You've got to love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. And this one, it's been brewing up for a long time now. Nice to see all my work has not gone to waste. Oh, yes, sir. Now, many a marble has had to fall in place for all of this to come off. Patience is a virtue, as they say. But this was torturous. 
Oh, yes, it was. Months of planning, months of waiting. But we kept ourselves busy, of course. Initially, I was behind the escape from that hellish trap. Honestly, I didn't expect any of us to get out of that scrap. Of course, one of us didn't. And the Ogs took a pure hammering something fierce. Poor dim bastards, but tough as old nails, as they say. But, infamy itself, we got taken. And when we recovered from taking our lumps, they didn't even have the decency to execute us. Tell vermin. Wanted to play all nicey, nicey. Codswop. So I set out on my own little long war. And by heck, it's paying off. Tau dominated humans. Poor saps bought by baubles. Clean. Fresh air. You worry about clean, boy. Food. Fresh, you say? Does it help me kill Xenos faster, then? No, thank you very much. I'll have the protection of the Emperor, if it's all the same to you. And so, we began. I was always several steps away from any activity, but I called those shots. And some of the fuzzies helped out for a bit, till we was all broken up. But, by the Emperor's grace, the stuffed shirt in charge, Piter, only gifts me with the ultimate blessing, doesn't he? He gives me the ratty boys. Oh, <laughs> yes, he does. And from there, it's sanguinala every day since. The silly boy. He didn't know what we were going to unleash on him. Now, one compliment, mind you. That Piter, he's a cool one, all right. Never ordered culls or warning executions, no matter what we did. I guess he's not all bad, but bad enough. Xenos loving scum. So, I gets to making sure the ratty boys confuse the camp to guards the issue. And of course, their number. And when next they go out to play, they carry a good head for the landscape out there. Days bleed into weeks, weeks into months. But we keep at it. Ratties can skip off when they want, but we stick about to gain info. And Genteel Piter is always on hand to help out too. We know exactly what he wants. He's about as subtle as a drunk squaddy approaching a damsel. So we interrogate him more than he ever gets anything out of us. But this, this is the big one because we gained intel from ratty spies that our boys were close. So, off a couple went to have a natter. Carry my message, at least in part, I hoped. Incorrigible little tykes, if they remembered any of it. <laughs> but back, the ratties come. So we send out responses. Only two. Little fatties are good, but best not to risk it, eh? And that paid off. In spades because we are now all waiting, anticipating. And there he is, the unmissable, poetic, beautiful rhythm of his tracks approaching. It is indeed the one, the only, Bonus Bill, the company Bane Blade. He rumbled forward, and as he came out of the dark, things started exploding left, right and centre. The gun nests of first, of course. Smashed by heavy bolt of fire. <laughs> The main buildings pop one by one as Bill introduces himself and his main battle cannon. As he is now clear in view, the dark comes alive just past the fence. And a few explosions later, and the main columns are down, and the fields drop. And we, <laughs> the Tau prisoners, are out into the night. I plough forward, but am stopped as I get closer to the bonus one. I want to give that huge Bane Blade a kiss. And I'm not alone, but there it comes out of the night. A chap I recognise. One of the, uh, intelligence lads. He quickly barks out if I've brought my crew. <laughs> I nod. So do the boys. And then he tugs us around old Bill. And bless me. There it is. Toadin has agreed, but still a shock to see it actually happening. I thought all of this 
was but motivational grog's dung. Something to tell us to put, you know, some lead back in the pencil. But Bill has bought us a new lady. Oh, yes, he has. She ain't a stunner. She ain't a shiny new one. But when I set eyes on her, I stand back. I feel the lads around me, next to me. I throw my arms around the two closest, and it passes on. And we, as a group, we bask in her glory, just for a second. I am smitten. I'm in love. And I see that same adoration in the lads, as we look at her with dumb grins on our faces, like she was a sister of battle in a shower. She's gorgeous, and she's all ours. And she, she is a Malkador heavy battle tank. Now, not once did the Blueberries ask themselves why we were here. Oh, they have the same whiff of arrogance as the Eldar about them, but they don't have the experience to back it up. So they underestimate us at every turn. We were barbarians, right? No need for a reason. The Imperium of Man just attack anything different to them. <laughs> Stupid. We always have a reason, we humans. But we, as a race, as an army, have been around the block. We don't signpost our plans and motivations now, do we? No, we don't. We came here, this planet, as a start. This is the forward party only. And we were told to try to take this world as special. Because it's an armory world. What does that mean, eh? We got stuff down here locked away from even the eyes of the locals. Beyond their scope to remember, it's even here. Let alone where it is. Ranks and ranks of stuff hoarded up low, deep in the ground. And my beautiful brothers in arms have not only found it, but bought some of these big ladies out of mothballs. Praise be to the Emperor. He does indeed provide. So, we jump into her and we make friends. She is already fired up, but we take control. Now Shane is versatile as our first gal, our lovely Russ. I will always miss her, will will. But getting a crack at that nippy Bernie Bernie tank, well, that was more fun than I'd expected. And now, I feel we have been prepared. Because this old girl is as fast as a Bernie, but heavy, heavier than even a Russ. She'll need pointing a lot more in the right direction, of course. But she ain't half also going to be a thirsty gal. But right now, after so long, grumpy, gobby, and ears all look to me, and I beam down. We know their local reaction force has a hammerhead. It's less than ten minutes away. We can go put a stop to her gate-crashing the party. Or we can stalk about until they show themselves. Take a clean shot. But it risks bonus bill. And that sounds like a tardy way to repay his assistance. Oh, yes it does. Says I. Let's get some revenge in. Go to them. Says Gobby. No rebuttals come. All right then, lads. Let's do this. Says I. As a bane blade bill trundles through the camp, it continues its rampage. Tower forces arriving piecemeal are slaughtered. Their light vehicles smashed, their makeshift lines exterminated. All as it makes its way to the attached airfield. This raid was not about us captives, us prisoners, not initially. It was about destroying resources. A very clear happy happenstance for all, thinks I. Because when they found out where we were, oh yeah. They were going to attack twice as fast. So, we race off next to a tower road. The Malkador had muscles and broke through hedge, tree or outcrop with ease. And within six minutes, we were in position, laying in wait. And just as the ratties had reported, the sleek tower hover tank came sipping along the track at a phenomenal speed. 
I raise my hand, and all watch it as I then lower it. The main battle tank cannon tore out. Gobby tried to sink in another shot straight after. Grumpy and ears blasted out with heavy bolters and auto cannons. Shot filled the air. Some of it even hit. The thing was struck, but continued its speed at least. It wobbled and spun. I thought it might hit the outcrops of rocks, but it steadied itself again almost instantly. And that is when we plough directly into it. <laughs> we shot forward into its path. Why? Well, blue boys don't make things tough now, do they? All the shields, all the spells, all the moving round. All very nice. But it relies on them being paper thin. And we couldn't be guaranteed to take it out by boom booms alone. And, as planned, this hammerhead struck our top, spun over it and slammed into the rocks. It plumed with a strange green fire as it went up. Smashed. All aboard killed, of course. And we turned our guns on the advancing support infantry. Splat, 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 they went under our fire. It felt good to take some payback. And the new girl was indeed fast. As we revved and ran more of them down. All for the protection of Bill, of course. A sort of homage to how he left the valley all those months ago. Little blueberries bursting, bursting, bursting under our tanky, tanky, tanky. <laughs> but soon they ran out. The event over, the camp opened, the airfield done for, and the reserves crushed. Well, we scarper. It's time to link up our little guerrilla forces together again, because our second wave is coming. Oh, yes. And we have all the firepower we now need from the stocks that were left on this planet so many years ago. Blue boys are in trouble now. Oh, yes, they are. And we are linking up with Bill. But stop off to have a shifty about for someone special. <laughs> I was only half-dressed when the first explosion hit the building. It was followed by raking imperial fire. Men and women erupting into the corridors were near the front. They exploded as bolt shot hit them and transformed them into awful. Bags filled with blood, their contents splashed across ceiling, wall and floor. I slammed my door closed and dove for the window, out of it. I was mid-air when the second round hit the building with such force, it sent it flying over me like a wave of masonry unmade. And I came down hard, very. Fire had brushed my body, scorching, but not lighting. Ringing. Ringing in my ears. I could not hear. All I could see was darkness above, fire around me. I put my head down and crawled. Ash was falling, thick as storming snow. I was clawing with the only arm I had left that worked. The other was numb, with some shooting pains at the shoulder. I gulped when I moved wrong. This led to inhaling ash and smoke. I racked with coughing, everything lit up with pain. I slowed. I could not endure much more. Then, a stinging dull thud in my side, and I'm on my back. I opened my eyes, slits against the ash snow. And there they are, above me. I cannot hear it, but their mouths are open, their tongues out. They are making that derisive noise again. I know it, but because the tables have turned, they now have me. A boot slams into my face. I lose consciousness. I awake in pain. I cannot breathe through my nose. It is smashed. One eye will not open at all. My arms are tied behind me. Agony in my shoulder. My ribcage also. They must have put the boot in while I was passed out. I taste dry copper on my tongue. At least I still have that. My tongue. The ringing is bad but I can hear. 
and I hear his voice. I am in a dark, dank room, somewhere deep within the earth. A synthetic light is above us, a table before me, a chair beneath and behind me. Good morning, sleeping beauty. It is Skipper. Why am I alive? I did not think I had said it. I thought I thought it. You, Piter, are alive to receive a great choice. Because, you know, you was good to me in the lands. But you did get one of us killed, and you are a filthy collaborating traitor. So your choices aren't expansive. In fact, there are only two. I can see he is relishing this. But beneath it all, some kindness. Perhaps I have had some small effect on he and his crew. Something that will grow, perhaps, and be an unstoppable tidal wave of change one day. I do not die in vain. So, he continues, the lads have been thinking, and we boiled it down into two options. One, driver, because it's simple, and we need the new one. Two, death. We pass you over to the commissars and they execute you. Not great, I know, but not all bad, eh? Once fast, at least. I nod. Then I painfully straighten my neck. I bring my head up and I look at him as solidly as I can in the eye. I'd rather be dead. After everything you said to me? Oh, talk, was it just a... Anything is better than death. Why not choose life? <laughs> you hypocrite, says he. But you respect me more for it, don't you? He nods. Oh, yes. Has to be said, I do. But then, we had to rub off on you eventually. You are human after all. I refute that we are anything alike. Oh, yeah, that'll help. You do that. He beamed at me. Then his face darkened. The smile did not leave it, but it twisted. His eyebrows contracted. He looked. Demonic. Well then, Piter, this is the route we are going to take. You'll <laughs> die then, but because we all like you so much, we reckon you should still be our driver. He then whispered to me, It doesn't take much thought, you see. I passed out. I woke, but I could not move. I had no idea how much time had passed. I just looked up at the light above me. I could not feel my body. And there they were again, all four of them, making their horrid noise at me. Yeah! <laughs> I could not move. Skipper then barked an order. And I could see myself rise, my arms pulling me up. My feet touched the ground. I cannot feel them. I walked toward him. I was not in command. I could not feel anything. He gave orders I could not understand. It was as if he was so far away, yet he was stood just before me. I could see him, but bare hear him. And off I went. My body, my prison. I was carried by my body outside. I watched as it got into the front seat of the tank and sat there, unable to move. I could feel the drool coming from the side of my open mouth. I could not close it. How? How does this serve the greater good? Then they get in. They expel gases on me. They spit on me. 
I can do nothing as they bruise my body. At a command, my body pushes the accelerator forward. My body drives the tank. And now, it is time to forge the narrative. It's been a while. It's vote time. Okay, Sipper, Grumpy, Gobby, Ears, and Piter, the Servitor, now have a tank again. But do we send them on further here, fighting on to disrupt the Tau until the heavy reinforcements arrive? Or do we just skip headlong into the larger fight back when the Imperium returns in force? Or the third option? We let these tankers retire from our tales. A story completed. The choice is yours. So hit the comment section and please, at the top of any comment, put in your vote. A letter A for guerrilla warfare. A letter B for the bigger battle. Or a letter C for retirement. Vote now. And no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.